with my 27 point ultimate financial game plan for financial success. We talked last time about defense winning championships. Today, we're going to talk about the financial offense. Think of it like in castles of old. You, you had a great big castle. If you had a great big castle without a moat that was fully stocked with alligators and a drawbridge and a big fence, you'd be screwed. So we talked about last time about defense winning championships. You need the moat fully stocked with alligators. But if you're all moat and no castle, that ain't no fun. On today's episode, we're going to tell you about how you can build a financial offense that wins championships. The 18 drawers of wealth that make up the savings and growth filing cabinets. If you remember, there are various filing cabinets of your wealth, the protection, savings, and growth filing cabinets. On this episode, we're going to talk about the savings filing cabinet and the growth filing cabinet. First, let's talk about the savings filing cabinet. Drawer number one is the wealth coordination account. This is something that nobody has, nobody does, and I would tell you why nobody's successful. I mean, there are people who are successful. Very few people have them. A wealth coordination account is a repository. It's just a simple bank account, but it's a bank account that you don't touch. It's not your revolving checking account. If you're on autopilot, if you're like me, I don't budget. I do everything on autopilot. Why? I don't want, I don't want to spend time budgeting. So if I'm just starting out with a new client, and you're just starting ahead, you're in your 20s, 30s, want to get ahead, I tell everybody to do this. Set up three different accounts. One direct deposit, 80% of your pay goes to your checking account for day-to-day -day needs. 10% you're saving for retirement, 10% you're putting into the wealth coordination account, 80% is going to your checking account. All wealth coordination account is a savings account or checking account or brokerage account that you're just not seeing, but once a quarter, once a year with your financial advisor, you're not touching that for day-to-day -day needs. And you put all your dividends from stock, all your rents that you receive from real estate into the wealth coordination account. Too many people, when they start building wealth, they grow cash stacks and then life passes them by. And then five years later, they have like 300 grand in an account and they don't really know why they have so much cash. This is when you start getting ahead financially. And then your cash is earning 0% instead of 5%, what you could earn safely now in a one year treasury. You could earn 5% right now in money markets. And a lot of people, they're still, still stuck at 0.1% at Bank of America. So the wealth coordination account allows you to not be a mindless slave to financial institutions. You set up three accounts. Like if you're just starting out, that wealth coordination account then goes, your financial advisor talks to you about the 10% that's going to retirement, the 10% that's going to wealth coordination accounts. And then the third account, that 80%, that's yours. You can spend it. You can give 10% to God. A lot of our clients will include tithing in that, but that's filing drawer one, wealth coordination account. Then you have checking and savings. That is file number two. File number three, credit unions. A lot of people don't know about credit unions. Many of them are nonprofits. I think all of them are nonprofits. They give you preferential rates. They give you generally better rates on debt, on credit cards, and even more preferential interest rates. We go a little bit further down, you have savings bonds. A lot of people don't know about savings bonds. Didn't my great grandmother Irma buy me a savings bond when I was born and it stuck in my dad's shoe box and he didn't give it to me until I was 42. When he died, I found it. That's why we inventory savings bonds. You may have them, you may not know where they're worth. We meet a lot of people, they have savings bonds. Guess what? They're making nothing on their savings bonds because they've matured and they just like the feeling of paper. Then we move to the next file, certificates of deposit, CDs, and then the next one, money markets. They're kind of different, but one in the same. Generally, banks offer CDs. You might say again, but didn't my granny do that? You know, she had the little passbook and she brought it to the bank and, and then the dot matrix printer. And she, you know, she, she loved it because she felt like she really had money. You know what though? I meet with a lot of young people and you may be in your 20s and 30s and kind of don't trust stocks altogether yet. A good way when you're starting out is to get a CD, get a money market and you start seeing, okay, I have a hundred grand in that account and it's earning $5,000 and I'm really doing nothing except I open up an account. Now for a number of years, those paid like zero to 1% because interest rates are higher. They're paying four or five, even five and a half percent right now. So that's a very powerful thing that you can use in your wealth arsenal. Now, the first six files in this filing cabinet or six drawers in the savings filing cabinet are all safe stuff, but 
you know, we're starting to get a little bit more interest. You earn a little bit more in a money market and a CD than you would a bank account. Then we go to the next drawer, annuities, deferred annuities, immediate annuities, post-tax retirement accounts. We'll do a whole show on this, but simply put, this is money that you're taking that is after tax money and it's growing tax free. So that can be a powerful way to accumulate wealth. There are good annuities, there are bad annuities, there are high fee annuities, there are low fee annuities. And annuity is not a curse word. As Jane Bryan Quinn wrote in one of her books, she called them the Rodney danger field of the financial world. And they don't get no respect. I don't get no respect around here. So they don't get respect, but they do serve a very valid purpose for guaranteed income for life based on the claims paying ability of the underlying insurance company. So you want to pick a highly rated insurance company. And there are also things called post-tax retirement accounts, non-deductible IRAs. You could look at doing what's called the backdoor Roth. That's another file, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks. The beauty of a Roth is the money grows tax-free and pulls out tax-free. Annuities are post-tax, grow tax-free. When you pull out the money, you got to pay tax on the growth. Roth money, when you pull it out, you don't pay any tax. If, if you follow the IRS code. Then we move to tax deductible vehicles, IRAs, 403Bs, 457s. Those are the alphabet soup of the investment world. If there's a number behind it, it means the government is in charge. Charles in charge. The government is in charge. You know, Scott Bayo was uh, Charles in charge, right? You know, the government is in charge of your IRA, 401k. They set the rules. They set at what rate you would pay. This is how good the financial industry lobbied Congress. We have a product now, and there's nothing wrong with 401ks or IRAs, but there's a negative. The negative is the government controls the rate at a future time when you take money out. You could say, well, I'm not gonna do a 401k then. Well, you'd be an idiot because you could get some of the biggest benefits in the tax code to grow well, but you have to be cognizant of the rules. One of the rules is the government wants your money and they want it now and they want it later. So the beauty of a 401k or IRA, they don't get your money now, but they will get it later. That's the deal. In a Roth, they're getting it now. They're promising they're not going to tax take it later. Doesn't mean that a 401k is bad. 401k is great. Generally, I like people to max out their 401k up to the match. And if you're making a lot of money, you need the write-offs, max it out full bore. But you got to know, should you Roth? Should you non-Roth? That'll be a whole nother show. Then we'll go to the growth filing cabinet. First drawer, T-bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds, a lot of a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, they don't even know what that is. Like It sounds like I'm going to buy a treasury note. What am I, 88? No, you know, you could give your money right now to the government and get five and a half percent no risk. It's not bad. That's a treasury bill. You could buy six month T-bills, three month notes, you could buy one year bonds. Basically, they're bonds with the government and there are strips and there are zero coupon bonds. Zero coupon bonds used to be good. Susie Orman was really into them. They kind of suck right now, but T-bills are hot. Uh, then we go to bonds. These are more, you're loaning money to Microsoft. You're loaning money to Apple. A corporation is paying you interest. You give them a hundred grand, they give you 3%. Then there are convertible gut bonds, there are debentures and there are corporate bonds. We're just gonna keep it very simple you're buying a company's debt. Then we have, you're buying a government's debt. The benefit of municipal bonds, it's tax-free. Then we move to preferred stocks, convertible preferred stocks, participating preferred stocks. Isn't preferred stock a cologne, like a cheap cologne that you buy at like Kohl's for like $4.99 that nobody wants? I think it was called preferred stock, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about stock in a company that's giving preferential treatment in a bankruptcy. Then we go to common stock. It's really what you think of when you think of stocks. Blue chip stocks in those companies that people like. Dow companies, large cap companies, well-established companies. You know who they are. The Walmarts, the, the Disneys, the whatever. Then people sometimes think that buying individual stocks is kind of risky. So they say, I don't want to buy that. So then you buy an investment company called a mutual fund or an exchange traded fun. That's the next drawer. Then you could do options, commodities. All of these things represent growth opportunities. Now you could have literally a little bit in each drawer of the filing cabinet, and that's a good way to diversify. So a lot of people talk about diversification. I firmly believe diversification can sometimes mean diversification of your portfolio. 
Because people think diversification means many different things. Like I own a bunch of stuff. I'm diversified. No, well, you might own all U.S. companies. You just may own 500 different U.S. companies. Well, that's not diversification. This internal design review that we do gives you macro strategic asset allocation, macroeconomic principles. Then we go to art collections, antiques, rare coins, precious metals. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. That's a drawer in the filing cabinet. But notice it's not the whole drawer. We had people with Robinhood and the meme stock craze put all their money in that stuff. And I think the only two cryptocurrencies really standing are Ethereum and Bitcoin. But the point I'm saying here is if you had this model, you will visually see. By the way, one of the things that we offer all of our listeners, so it's not that you need one thing. That's true diversification. Then we go to real estate, personal residences, farmland, personal property, business property. Then we go to business interests, livestock, racehorses, equipment leasing, personal businesses. So we have a model that includes everything from Bitcoin to tax shelters to personal residences to your Airbnb houses. Most financial advisors, you talk to them about cryptocurrency, you talk about Bitcoin, you talk about real estate. They always try to persuade you away from that so you invest more with them. Now, I'm not saying put all your money in those things. I'm just saying, if you're more of a real estate junkie, we can work with you. If you're more of a crypto head, we can work with you. And in conclusion, let's highlight the 27-point checklist from both a defensive standpoint and an offensive standpoint. So in the game of football, you have your D-line, you have your linebackers and your safeties. So too, in your financial defensive set, you have your D-line, that's your car insurance, your home insurance, your liability insurance. That is your first line of defense. Then you have your linebacking core. You have your, uh, they're going to rush the passer. You have your disability insurance, long-term care insurance, social security insurance, and health insurance. And then you have your safeties, your defensive backs. They're going to prevent, hopefully run the prevent defense and hopefully intercept the opposing team's uh, onslaught against you. Make sure they don't score a touchdown. That's why you got to have a will trusts, ownership agreements if you own a business, and life insurance. That's your defensive set. Your offensive set, think of the O-line, your offensive line. Those are your savings programs, your checking account, your savings account, your credit unions, your CDs, your I-bonds, your government-backed bonds. Then you have a little bit more like your running backs. Those, that's your 401k. You get that right off. You go that extra five yards. You want to have the Derrick Henry of the running back in your financial life. That's your annuities, that's your Roths, your 529s, your IRAs, your retirement savings plans, all of those things are incorporated into your running back core. Then you have your receiving core. Those are your growth plays. That's how you make that big play down the field, that 20-yard touchdown pass, that 40-yard touchdown pass. Those are your bonds, your stocks, your ETFs, and your real estate programs. Those are going to have greater potential for loss in that you could get an interception, but they have greater potential for gain in that you could score that touchdown on that Hail Mary pass.